The information provided in this podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship with FOIL Legal. For advice tailored to your situation, please consult a qualified legal professional. Welcome to Personal Injury Claims Explained by FOIL Legal, your trusted source for understanding personal injury claims in Western Australia. Each week, we simplify complex legal issues, from motor vehicle accidents to workplace injuries, so you can confidently navigate your rights and claim the compensation you deserve. Ever tripped over something at work? Or maybe you've noticed a nagging pain, you know, one that's gotten worse over time thanks to your job. It happens. It's not always a sudden thing. Yeah. Sometimes those workplace injuries, they can really sneak up on you. Yeah. But what happens when you need to take time off to recover? Who covers those bills? Right. That's where things can feel like a maze, like a maze of paperwork and legal jargon, especially here in Western Australia. Yeah. But don't worry, you are not alone. Today, we're doing a deep dive into the Workers' Compensation and Injury Management Act of 2023. Okay. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know, but we're going to break it down. Of course. Into plain English and give you that essential knowledge without the headache. So you know your rights and what to do if you ever find yourself, you know, God forbid, needing to navigate the system. Exactly. That's exactly right. This act is like the rule book for both employees and employers here in WA when it comes to workplace injuries. It's designed to make it crystal clear, you know, who's responsible for what. Right. And what steps need to be taken if, heaven forbid, you're injured on the job. Okay, so we're diving headfirst into this official document, excerpts and all. Absolutely, yeah. Taking a look, and it is dense. It's a good thing you're here to help us untangle it all. I'd be to help. And believe me, I understand that diving into legal documents isn't exactly everyone's idea of a good time. Right. So let's start with the basics. Before we even get into the nitty gritty of making a claim or understanding your entitlements, we need to define who this act actually covers. Right, because worker doesn't always mean who you think it means. You got it. You got it. While it does cover people employed in those more you know, traditional nine to five jobs, it also extends to contractors, working directors, and even you know, folks hired for specific projects. As long as they're doing a major part of the work personally, they're not just subcontracting it all out. So let's say you're a freelance graphic designer working from your home office. Okay. Yeah. Could you still be considered a worker under this act? You absolutely could be, especially if you have a direct contract with a company for regular services. Okay. And you haven't, again, just passed the whole thing off to someone else. And get this, the act even covers licensed jockeys. Jockeys. So even if you're, even if you're riding racehorses, you're still considered a worker and you have rights under this act. That's not your average desk job. No. That really shows just how broadly this act is written. It does. It does. Okay. So we've established who it covers. Now let's talk about what it covers. Yeah. What exactly qualifies as an injury from employment? Is it just physical injuries? That's a great question. And it's actually a much broader category than you might think. Yeah. Of course, it includes those, you know, immediate, obvious injuries. You slip on a wet floor, you fall off a ladder, those sorts of things. But it also covers things like diseases you might contract because of your work environment, pre-existing conditions that are made worse by your job and even psychological or psychiatric conditions. Wow, so if someone develops, like, carpal tunnel syndrome after years of piping away at their computer, yeah. right, right, that could be covered under this act. Exactly. It makes yeah. sense, right? If your job is the primary cause of your injury or illness, then you should be entitled to support. Having said that, mental health claims can be a, a bit more nuanced. Okay. For instance, if you're experiencing a psychological disorder primarily because of, let's say, reasonable administrative actions taken by your employer, right, that wouldn't automatically qualify you for compensation. So it's not a free pass for anyone who's just having a tough day at the office. That's right. That's right. Think of it this way. The act is trying to find that good balance right. between protecting employees, but then also making sure the system is used fairly. Right. There needs to be a clear link between your work and your condition. Okay. It's not just, you know, any stress that kind of crops up. Yeah. It needs to be something significantly caused by your work. Okay, that makes sense. Now, let's say someone does experience a legitimate workplace injury. Right. What happens then? Yeah. What rights do they have and what kind of support can they expect? The first thing you need to know is 
you have the right to make a claim for compensation. Okay. But this is important. You need to act fast. Okay. You only have 12 months from the date of your injury to actually submit your claim to your employer. 12 months. That feels like a pretty tight deadline. It is, yeah. Especially considering some injuries might not even like make themselves fully known right away. Right. What if someone doesn't realize, I don't know, the extent of their injury or how it's connected to their work until later down the line? That's why it's so important to be informed and take action as soon as possible. Don't wait, you know? Mm -hmm. If you think your injury or illness might be work-related, even if you're not 100% sure, talk to your employer, submit a claim. It's always better to err on the side of caution. Sure. Now, if your claim is accepted, the act outlines several different types of compensation you might be entitled to. Okay. Including, you know, income replacement if you're unable to work, coverage of your medical expenses, and even things like travel costs for treatment. And the employer is the one who's legally obligated to pay this compensation. Really. Exactly. Of course, there are processes in place if an employer disputes a claim. We'll get into those in a bit. Okay. But the key takeaway here is you have a right to financial support while you recover. And there's even something called provisional payments where your employer might actually have to start paying you before any fault is determined. Really? It's like a safety net to make sure that you're not left high and dry while everything gets sorted out. That's good to know. So even if there are disagreements about the claim, the worker isn't left stranded financially. Exactly. So what happens next? Let's dive into how the amount of income compensation is actually calculated, because I'm sure that's a big question for anyone who finds themselves you know, needing to take time off work. Absolutely. And it's a good thing we have all this great information at our fingertips. The act is pretty clear on this point. Essentially, it's calculated based on your pre-injury weekly income. Okay. But it can get a little more specific depending on whether you're totally or partially incapacitated. Okay. So you're saying there are different calculations depending on whether someone is like completely unable to work or if they can still manage some duties. Exactly. Let's unpack that a bit, because I imagine that makes a big difference in someone's life, you know, if they're relying on this compensation. You're spot on. It really does. And it's all laid out pretty clearly in the act, thankfully. If you're considered totally incapacitated, meaning you can't work at all, right? the act says you should typically receive 100% of your pre-injury weekly income for the first six months. Okay. After that initial period, the compensation drops down to 85% of your usual pay. So it's like a tiered system. Yeah. With a bit more support in those like crucial early months of recovery. What about folks who can handle some work, but maybe not their full, you know, job description? That's where the partial incapacity calculation comes in. So let's say you're a builder who's injured their hand. Okay. You might not be able to swing a hammer just yet, right? but you could potentially manage some lighter tasks back at the office. In this case, the compensation is adjusted to reflect what you're able to earn while you recover. Okay. The act actually has specific formulas for this, taking into account your pre-injury earnings and what you're realistically able to earn with your current limitations. It sounds like they've really tried to cover those, like, in between situations yeah, have. where you're not fully back on your feet, but you're not, you know, completely out of commission either. It's about finding that balance. Yeah. This might be a bit specific, but what if someone was earning extra income before their injury, like through bonuses or allowances? It's like you factored in. Absolutely. The act is pretty comprehensive when it comes to defining earnings. We're not just talking about your base salary here. They include things like overtime pay, bonuses, commissions, and even the value of any room and board provided by your employer. So, for example, if you're a FIFA worker who regularly receives site allowances as part of their pay, right. those allowances would be included when calculating their pre-injury income. Exactly. The goal is to ensure that the compensation you receive accurately reflects the actual income you've lost yeah. due to your workplace injury. Okay. And they even have specific provisions for, you know, working directors, for example, using their declared remuneration from the company to figure out their pre-injury income. It's all about making sure the system is fair, you know, and takes those individual circumstances into account. Yep. It sounds like they've really tried to, like, think of everything. They've tried to cover all the bases, yeah. Now, we've focused a lot on, like, the worker's side of things. Right. But what about the employer's obligations? Yeah. We touched on their responsibility to pay compensation, but what steps do they need to take when a worker makes a claim? That's a crucial part of the process, too. The Act outlines some clear steps for employers to follow. Okay. First and foremost, they need to notify their insurer or work cover WA if they're self-insured 
within a specific time frame. They can't just sit on that information. Right. Then they need to provide the worker with liability decision notice. This basically tells the worker whether or not they're accepting responsibility for the claim. And what happens if there's a disagreement? Okay. Let's say the employer disputes the claim. Then what? That's where things can get a little more complex. Right. But the good news is that the Act lays out a clear dispute resolution process. Okay. It's not just a case of the employer saying no, and that's the end of it. There are formal mechanisms in place, like conciliation and arbitration, right. to ensure that disputes are handled fairly. So it's more like a, like a structured conversation where both sides get to present their case. Exactly. And there's a neutral third party who helps like try to find a solution. Exactly. And importantly, even while this dispute resolution process is playing out, right. the employer might still need to be making those provisional payments to support the worker. Okay. It's about making sure that worker is taken care of while things get sorted out. That makes sense. It's reassuring to know there are like safeguards in place. So let's shift gears a bit and talk about returning to work after an injury. Okay. Yeah. What does the act say about you know, getting people back on their feet, so to speak. Well, the Act places a huge emphasis on helping people get back to suitable employment as soon as it's safe and possible. Okay. It recognizes that returning to work can be a really important part of someone's recovery, both physically and mentally. Sure. And it's not just about, you know, pushing people back into any kind of work. Right. The Act is clear that the work needs to be appropriate yeah. for the worker's recovery and capabilities. So it's not a like a one-size-fits-all approach. It's not. It um, takes into account the individual's, you know, needs and limitations. Exactly. What does that look like in practice? So employers are required to work with the injured worker to create what's called a return-to-work program. Okay. And this needs to be done in consultation with the worker's treating doctor. Okay. This program can include things like, you know, modified duties, adjustments to the workplace itself, right, or even retraining opportunities. It sounds like a collaborative process. It should be, yeah. And I'm guessing the worker has responsibilities too, right? Absolutely. It's a two-way street here. Right. The worker needs to actively participate in that return to work program, attend any medical assessments that are scheduled, okay, and make a genuine effort to return to work as soon as they're able to. It's about both sides, you know? Right. So open communication is key here. Absolutely, yeah. Now, we can't talk about returning to work without talking about the role of medical professionals in all of this. Right. Of course. Yeah. The Act has quite a bit to say about their involvement, doesn't it? It certainly does. And this is another area where the Act really prioritizes the worker's rights and well-being. It reinforces your right to choose your own doctor. Okay. You can't be forced to see a doctor selected by your employer or the insurance company. That's really important. Having that, you know, control over your own medical care. It is, yeah. Can make a big difference. Absolutely. So what role does the treating doctor play in, like the workers' compensation process? Their role is crucial. They're the ones diagnosing the injury, determining when you're fit to return to work, and providing those all-important certificates of capacity that guide the return to work process. What happens in cases where there might be, like, I don't know, doubts about a worker's capacity or if there are disagreements about you know, the nature of their injuries? That's a great question. And it does happen. In those situations, the act allows for independent medical examinations. Okay. For example, if your employer or their insurer disagrees with your treating doctor's assessment, right? they can request an independent examination by a different doctor. Right. It's a way to get a second opinion and ensure everyone is on the same page. So it makes sense. It's a, it's a safeguard. Exactly. To make sure things are assessed fairly. That's the idea. So when it comes to the like actual cost of treatment, who foots the bill for doctor's appointments, medications, and, you know, other health services. Right, right. That's all covered under what's called medical and health expenses compensation. Basically, your employer is also liable for these costs. Okay. It's not coming out of your pocket. Yeah. Now, there is a limit on this compensation. Okay. It's a percentage of the overall maximum compensation outlined in the act. But it's there to ensure you can access the treatment you need. So there's a cap on how much the employer has to pay. There is. For medical treatment related to, to a workplace injury. That's right. But what happens is someone's injuries are, you know, severe and require ongoing expensive treatment. You're right to point that out because there are provisions in place to address those situations. 
if you find yourself in a situation where you need extensive treatment that goes beyond that standard limit, right. you can apply to an arbitrator for a special increase. The Act recognizes that sometimes those standard limits might not be enough, and there are avenues for seeking additional support. That's reassuring to know. What about, um, what about rehabilitation? Yeah. Is that something that's covered under medical expenses as well? It is. The Act recognizes that treating the initial injury is just one part of the puzzle. Right. It's equally important to support workers in their long-term recovery. That's where workplace rehabilitation expenses compensation comes in. Okay. This covers things like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, even psychological counseling. So it's not just about, like, patching people up and sending them back to work. No. It's about helping them, like, regain their full functionality. Exactly, yeah. Get back to their lives. Yeah. And to ensure the quality of these services, the Act has introduced this concept of approved workplace rehabilitation providers. Okay. These are providers who have met specific criteria and have been approved by WorkCover WA. Right. So you know you're in good hands. It's like a quality control measure. Exactly. To make sure that workers are getting effective treatment yeah. from, you know, qualified professionals. That's exactly it. And this approval process helps maintain the integrity of the system. So far we've talked about, you know, temporary incapacity, but what happens if a worker's injuries result in, like, longer-term limitations? Right. How does the Act address the concept of permanent impairment? That's a really important point to bring up. We've been focusing on getting back to work. But what happens when that's not fully possible? Mm. How does the act handle those situations wherein injury might have lasting effects? Right. Not all workplace injuries are temporary. Exactly. Some can, unfortunately, result in long-term limitations. Right. And that's where, I guess, this assessment of permanent impairment comes in. It does, yeah. What can you tell us about that? So the act outlines a very specific process for this. Okay all centered around something called the Permanent Impairment Guidelines. Okay, let's break that down. What are those guidelines exactly? Think of them as the rule book okay. for figuring out the extent of someone's permanent impairment. Right. They're issued by Work Cover WA, and they provide detailed criteria for evaluating how an injury has impacted, you know, your body, your ability to function in, in everyday life. So it's not just a matter of the worker saying, hey, I'm still hurting. Right, right. There's a standardized system to kind of assess it objectively. Exactly. And to make sure those assessments are done properly, yeah. they're carried out by accredited professionals okay. who've received, you know, specific training from yeah. WorkCover WA. Okay. They review your medical history, they conduct a physical exam, and they may even order, you know, additional tests right. to determine the extent of the impairment. So it's a it's a thorough process. And how is the impairment actually like expressed is it like a like a rating system it is a sort of rating system the impairment mm. is measured as a percentage so for instance you might be assessed as having a 15 percent permanent impairment to your shoulder right or you know a 10 percent impairment to your back okay depending on how your injury has affected you that makes sense it's a way to like quantify the impact mm -hmm. but what does that percentage actually mean for the worker in like real world terms. This is where it gets really important because that percentage plays a big role in determining your entitlements, including something called permanent impairment compensation. Okay. This is a lump sum payment. Right. That's calculated based on the severity of your impairment. So to put it simply, if someone has a higher percentage of impairment, they would typically be eligible for a larger lump sum payment. Generally, yes. However, there is a maximum limit on the total amount of compensation that can be paid. This is known as the general maximum amount. Right. But the key takeaway here right. is that the Act recognizes that some injuries have lasting consequences. Right. And it aims to provide, you know, additional financial support in those cases. And I imagine the Act has kind of like built-in processes for what happens if there's a disagreement about the assessment. Right. What if the worker feels like the assessment isn't accurate. You're right. It's not always smooth sailing. Right. And that's why the Act has a dispute resolution process specifically for this. Okay. If you disagree with your permanent impairment assessment, you have the right to request a review. Okay. If a resolution can't be reached through that review process, you can then take the matter to arbitration, which is like a more formal hearing process. It's all about making sure everyone has a fair chance to have their voice heard and that those assessments are as accurate as possible. That's good to know. Having those kinds of processes in place can 
make all the difference when it comes to you know, navigating something as complex as workers' compensation. It does. Now, shifting gears a bit, you mentioned earlier that the Act covers like diseases contracted as a result of work. Right, right. This might seem like a simple question, but does that include those like serious occupational diseases we often hear about? Yeah. Things like asbestosis or mesothelioma. It absolutely does. The Act has a whole section specifically dedicated to dust diseases, okay. which includes those conditions you mentioned. Right. And because these diseases can be so complex right. and often have, you know, such serious long-term health implications, the Act outlines specific procedures for making a claim, including a requirement for assessment by a specialist panel. So there's a, like a dedicated pathway. There is, yeah. For those types of claims. Yeah. It sounds like they like take them very seriously, which they are. Absolutely they do. These aren't your, you know, everyday injuries. Right, right. The dust disease medical panel is made up of medical experts right. who are specifically qualified to diagnose these diseases and assess their severity. Okay. Their determination is crucial in deciding what kind of compensation you're entitled to. So it's a way to ensure that these like complex cases are handled with the appropriate level of like expertise. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Now let's dive into something that I think a lot of people find particularly complex and honestly, potentially intimidating. And that's common law claims. What can you tell us about those and how they relate to this act? So common law claims yeah. are definitely a whole other layer of this system. Yeah. In a nutshell, the act allows injured workers under certain circumstances to pursue additional damages from their employer through the court system. Okay. This is in addition to any compensation they're already receiving under the kind of, you know, statutory workers' compensation scheme. So it's like an extra avenue for seeking compensation? Exactly. But it's important to understand that common law claims are based on the idea of negligence. Right. To be successful, you actually have to prove that your employer breached their duty of care to you. Okay. And that this breach directly caused your injury. So it's a higher bar to clear. It is, yeah. You need to be able to show that your employer was at fault. Yeah, that's right. And what kind of damages are we talking about in these cases? That's where things get interesting because common law damages can be much broader than the statutory compensation we discussed earlier. They can include things like Compensation for your pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, future economic losses. Right, right. On top, you know, on top of things like medical expenses. So the potential payouts could be, you know, significantly higher. They can be, yeah. Than what you'd receive through the standard workers' compensation process. That's right. But it's important to be realistic, you know. Right. Pursuing a common law claim is a big decision. Right. And it's not right for everyone. It often requires a lawyer, and it can be a very lengthy and complex process. And I imagine there are, like, limitations on who can even bring a common law claim in the first place. You're right. It's not a free-for-all. Right. The Act has specific requirements. Well, For example, you generally need to have a certain degree of permanent impairment as a result of your injury right. to be eligible to pursue a common law claim. So it's not an option for every worker who's been injured. That's right. And it's definitely something you'd want to, you know, discuss with a legal professional to see if it's the right path for you. Absolutely. It's about, you know, understanding the complexities. Right. And weighing your options carefully. Now, I have one last question before we wrap things up. It's a bit of a curveball, but something that's always struck me as fascinating from a legal perspective. Okay, yeah. How does the Act address workplace injuries that are caused by something as well, as extraordinary as an act of terrorism. Uh, that's a great question. And it's something the act does address directly. It does. It does. It recognizes that acts of terrorism, well, hopefully rare, right. are a possibility. Of course. And it aims to ensure that workers who are injured in such events are still protected and entitled to support. So the same, like, basic principles of workers' compensation apply, even in those extreme circumstances? For the most part, yes. Workers injured in an act of terrorism have access to the same types of compensation as those injured in other workplace incidents. Okay. Of course, there are some specific provisions that come into play, you know. Right. Recognizing the unique nature of these situations. Right, for example. Well, there are special rules about insurance coverage. Say it. Yeah. And liability in the context of terrorism. Plus, the act allows for the minister to make a formal declaration that an event constitutes an act of terrorism. Right which then triggers certain provisions within the act. Right. So it's like a 
It's a way to ensure that the system can respond appropriately no, to these hopefully very rare, right. but incredibly serious situations. Wow. It's incredible to think about the level of detail and the range of scenarios that this act has been designed to cover. A lot of work went into it. We've covered a lot of ground today mm. from the most like basic definitions to some really complex legal concepts. It's been quite a journey. It has. And it just goes to show how important it is for both workers and employers right. to be informed about their rights and responsibilities in this area. Absolutely. The more you know, yeah. the better equipped you'll be to navigate the system if you ever need to. Absolutely. And it's reassuring to know that there is help available. There is. If you're ever unsure about something, WorkCover WA has a wealth of information on our website. They do. Yeah. And they're always a great resource if you have questions. Don't be afraid to reach out for guidance. That's such an important point. Knowledge is power in these situations. It really is. Don't hesitate to seek clarification if you need it. Well said. This deep dive has been a real eye-opener. It has been. And I hope our listeners feel, you know, more informed and empowered. I hope so, too. When it comes to understanding their rights and, and navigating the world of workers' compensation here in Western Australia. It's been a pleasure seeing you for this deep dive. And... And remember, everyone, stay safe out there. That's right. Safety first, always. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll see you next time for another deep dive into a new topic. Thank you for listening to Personal Injury Claims Explained by Foil Legal. We hope this episode helped clarify your rights and next steps in your injury claim. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and visit foillegal.com for more useful information. See you next time.